So we are currently in a series and we're talking about tackling mental illness. Um, of course, I told you in the beginning, uh, the very first part of the series, that early on in my walk with God, a gift began to operate in my life and I began to have some very unpleasant experiences. Very unpleasant experiences. In fact, they occurred after the first time I saw somebody get deliverance, which at one point made me wonder if it wasn't whatever the woman was being tormented with then came on me because it happened the very same night. She got free and I got bound. And it was the first time I had ever seen it. I was already scared because I didn't, I, I had read about demonic powers, but I had never seen anybody delivered from a demonic power. Uh, secondly, then it started happening in my life and I, it was such a, re, a harsh reality, I didn't know what to do. And I really thought that I was losing my mind, but I can tell you now that every symptom that I experienced during this period of torment, if I had gone to any kind of psychiatrist, I would have gotten diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar. Very positive that would have happened. Because not only did I begin to experience demonic things, I began to experience divine things where uh, I was hearing the voice of God. Now, nobody ever told us we were supposed to hear the voice of God, but I was hearing the voice of God. I was seeing things in visions and having a lot of dreams and the things that I saw would happen shortly thereafter. So I was seeing the future and nobody ever told me the, about these things. Hadn't been communicated to me because I didn't grow up in a, in a, um, I wasn't brought up in a church environment that exposed me to a life. My mother did not expose me to a whole bunch of different church environments. And so I did not understand or know that there were any other types of churches outside of Catholics, Methodists, and Baptists. I thought that was the extent of the Christian faith. I had no idea about Pentecostals and holiness and uh, the Kojics. And uh, I just didn't know anything about those things. I'd never heard of them. And so I hadn't been exposed to speaking in tongues, gifts of the spirits, none of that. And so now I'm having an encounter and the things I'm reading about in the Bible is real. And I didn't have a grid for those things. And it began to affect my mind. And ultimately, I was able to overcome those things. So when I talk to you about the struggles of mental illness, I'm not talking about this. Like the advantage I have on doctors and psychiatrists is that I've been there, done that, and won. They can't say that. So, and again, I said in every video, I'm not here to make the argument against their uh, discoveries or scientific uh, things, that conclusions they've come to, because I do believe in science and medicine. I am not one of those types of preachers. I think pe preachers who argue against the fact are just, you know, I'm not going to call them any names. But it's just unreasonable. Um, they're studying the world through the senses, and they're going to come up with conclusions based on those senses. And one of the reasons they haven't been able, and they admittedly know that they can't identify the cause of mental illness, nor can they identify the cure for mental illness. But we have that cure in the scripture, so we don't have to ponder it or wonder about it, if it's real, if it's not real. We know for a fact that God can fix it. And we sh and we looked at in the very first few videos, the various people who dealt with mental illness or symptoms of mental illness. And I even did a skit the last time to show you that had Jesus met any of you, you would have thought that he was crazy. In fact, in Mark 3, mm -hmm. I think it's Mark 3, Jesus' own family thought he was crazy. And the scriptures say, that Jesus, <clears throat> the scriptures say that Jesus, when he was teaching, it says, and the word got back and his people came to get him because they said he was out of his mind. And initially you think that these people that are coming to get Jesus, maybe these people are just the town people. But guess who shows up at the door? His mother and his brother. His mothers and his brother. His mother and his brother showed up. Because they thought he was crazy. 
There's nobody who would have met Jesus today who would have thought he was sane. If you walk through his first day, there he was, he had met Satan in the wilderness, right? Who can say that they met Satan in the wilderness and went in the wilderness for 40 days, didn't eat or drink, and then anybody, any rational mind, anybody who has been uh, uh, developed in the Western culture would have said, if you go out anywhere and do not eat and drink for 40 days, you are definitely going to have hallucinations. If you, it's just, it's just one of those physiological results of not having food and water. You're going to have some type of delusion. So it would have been very easy to dismiss Jesus as crazy as a lot of people did. And one time he was actually accused of being the prince of demons because people thought he was crazy because he didn't fit into their worldview. So when we talk about mental illness, some people have legitimate mental illness, Right. And I've said that throughout this series, that there are people who have legitimate mental illness. The Bible talks about, uh, in Deuteronomy 28, seeing things that are so harsh that the mind breaks under the pressure of what it's observing. That can happen. That does happen. And a lot of times, the people who've been molested, people who've been raped, people who've been abused, people who have been in war, people who have been in various situations. Again, I was in an accident a couple of weeks ago and almost wrecked my car. And immediately after I had flashback after flashback after flashback, just couldn't get away from the experience. Your mind can be damaged and broken. That is absolutely positively scientifically proven and factual. The Bible even supports that. But there are also people who have mental illness that is based on demonic interference. And we looked at that. We looked at it all throughout the scripture, there was King Saul. King Saul was clearly having manic episodes. And his manic episodes were clearly ascribed to a spirit that entered into his life. You look at King Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible says King Nebuchadnezzar, after a while, came under a, a point of delusion that he was so delusional that he thought he was an animal and he was out in the field. And the Bible says his hair grew and his claws grew like, grew like talons. And he was out in the field for seven years grazing with the sheep, grazing with the animals. He thought he was an animal. But we see that that, that state of mind, that switch of his change, state of mind from being sane to insanity comes by the influence or interference of a spiritual being. In this case, it was God. So the scriptures are filled with it. There's the lunatic boy. The Bible says moonstruck means lunatic or suffering from madness. You see that. So there was demons, their influence, demonic influence. But then we had all other kind of people who, again, if they sat on our couch today, there's absolutely no way they would pass the test of sanity. There's no person who would have embraced the life of Moses when he came out of the wilderness and said, hey, I met God. Well, how did he look? He talked to me and, I'm, and he talked to me from a bush that was on fire, but it didn't burn. He what? He talked to you from a bush. So God appeared to you as a burning bush. See, there's nobody in the Western world that would accept that. In fact, many people call, I have had friends of mine say that Christians are stupid or crazy because we believe fables. They call them fables because in the Western culture, it just doesn't logically fit. The stories make absolutely no sense they can't be proven by science or anything else. And so they just make no sense to us. And so many people, so there are examples of people with symptoms that, are, that, are, uh, uh, that we would clearly ascribe to mental illness. So when we're talking about this, then we have to then be very careful to diagnose it. This is why I always talk about the gift of discerning of spirits. It is my favorite gift. Because the gift of discerning the spirits allows us to discern between what is human, what is divine, and what is demonic. And it's very important to be able to do so. Because, again, as we looked at it, there were people who suffered mental illness because something was broken. There were people who suffered from mental illness because there was something demonic. There were people who suffered from mental illness because there was something divine. But you can't lump it all together. You have to be able to distinguish what is happening or, and what is the, at the source of the problem. And not being able to solve the problem is directly related to not being able to discover its source. 
So that's very important. So we talked about a lot of that stuff. And now I want to get into, and we talked about solutions. So uh, when I talk about the solutions to it, I started with talking about the mind from the biblical point of view. And we looked at all of the different things the Bible had to say about the mind. We looked at the fact that I always point out that it is the one thing that God tells us to guard more than any other part of us. He doesn't tell us to guard, you know, he tells us to guard our spirit by telling, talking to us about a spirit without walls. But he only says that in a very couple of places. But we looked at it several places over the scriptures where God tells us what to do with our mind, tells us to protect our mind, tells us to guard our mind, tells us what to set it on, tells us to gird up our minds, gives us the armor that directly depicts that it protects our mind. And that is because the Bible says it is with our minds that we serve God. So we looked at a lot of different things about the mind. We looked at all of the influences that happen by spiritual beings on the mind. We looked at them, of course, with Saul and, and Nebuchadnezzar. But then we just looked at it with Nebuchadnezzar when he was laying on his bed and it says, and thoughts entered into his mind. Whose thoughts? The ancient of days, God's thoughts. And they appeared as visual and they appeared as auditory. So they appeared in a way they came to his mind outside of his control, right? So we know that that is a tool that God uses in communication. It's not only a tool that God uses in communication. We know this is a tool that Satan uses in communication. And so that's one of the reasons why God stresses to us to be discerning. It's one of the reasons he stresses to us to watch over our thought life. I do not promote uh, just people just allowing their minds to do whatever it is they want to do. The Bible does not promote that kind of irresponsible behavior. He tells us what to do with it because it's so precious and it's at the core of our spiritual experience because with it, we serve God. So the first solution I dealt with was learning about the mind from the biblical point of view. What does the Bible say about it? Then we started dealing with the next part was the spiritual, accepting spiritual realities. Now, I'm going to reteach part of this because I didn't get to do it the way I like to do it. And I like to use a lot of scriptures because I don't like for people to believe me. You can believe what the scriptures say because the scriptures are so absolutely clear in what they depict. What we choose to believe, however, now that's on us. So the first thing I said is three spiritual realities. There's accepting the fact that there is a spiritual realm. It is something that a lot of people struggle to accept, embrace, or believe. If you have the gift of discerning the spirits, you will come to accept it. Hopefully you, you, you will. If not, it's going to cause you a lot of drama because you cannot discern without being aware. So the gift makes you aware of spiritual realities. You'll be aware of angels. You'll be aware of demons. You'll be aware that God is moving in the room. You will know that there's the spirit of deliverance is in the room or the spirit of healing is in the room. You will know these things because the gift of discerning of spirits causes you to become aware of such things, right? And so you have to embrace that there is a spiritual reality. You have to embrace that there is, this is not a world. There are not two worlds interacting apart from one another. There's one world and two realities interacting with each other. Angels are interacting with us daily. Demonic powers are interacting with us daily. And when we fail to acknowledge that, then the Bible says we are carnal minded, not carnal minded, not spiritual minded. And then we struggle to see things the way we're supposed to see them. So spiritual mindedness is so important because Paul says, look, he gives out a few instructions. I believe it's first Corinthians seven. He gives out a, a few instructions. I knew my, that YouTube wasn't going to work. He gives out a few instructions about marriage and some other things. And then he says this, let who you who are spiritual judge that these things are from God. You who are spiritual and you who are prophets. You know why? Because people who are unable to look at things from a spiritual point of view, they're not going to embrace the realities that God wants them to understand. And you're going to struggle 
with all kinds of things. So when we're talking about mental illness, we cannot ignore the spiritual reality. We can't ignore the fact that the spiritual realm is involved. So that's why I spilled all that time in the first couple of videos showing you just how involved the spiritual world is in interacting with us and how many cases and how many situations of, of mental illness of all forms, all kinds of symptoms you would see all throughout the scriptures, it's just present everywhere. So you can't solve it without being able to check it. Now, in my situation, again, a lady got delivered and then all of a sudden I got bound and I was having experiences and challenges. And then there was a point at which I was able to take charge of it. And part of being able to take charge of the experience and what was happening is that I accepted that there was a spiritual reality. Once I was able to accept that there was a spiritual reality, I was then able to deal with it. So that's where I want to go with tonight, because the first thing I said was dealing with accepting spiritual realities. The next thing is we have to establish our spiritual identity in Christ. Now, I'm going to challenge you in some ways with this, but we're going to look at some scriptures. And we sort of did this the last time, but I wanted to do this again because it's important to me that we always, always, always look at scriptures. I told you I hadn't been on here in a while. And one of the things that doesn't happen when I don't use my gift for a long time is it goes dormant. Then I got to stir it back up again. So let's talk about that. Understanding your spiritual identity in Christ is going to boil down to two things. One, you have to understand who God is. That's absolutely important. Because if you don't understand who God is, you're not going to understand what it means to even, when I get to authority, to even walk in authority. It's not going to happen. Hebrews 12, 6, I mean 11, 6 says, um, He that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of him who diligently seeks him. Now he says this, he must believe that he is. Is what? What are we believing that God is? That's an awkward way to, to, to that's an awkward statement. It's an awkward way to word that. But what are we believing that he is? We're believing that he is God. Now, it is possible to believe that God is God in one area and not God in another area. I'll give you an example. Most of us come into Christ and it's very easy for us to embrace the fact that God is our Savior. That is easy. We come in the door, we're excited, and we tell everybody, God saved me, God delivered me, God. But then when we get health challenges, there's another time in which we come to God, we might not be able to believe that he is the healer. So when he says, must first come to God believing that he is, it's sort of like when he said to Moses, tell them I am. He kind of leaves a space there so that you can fill in the blank because it's possible to believe that he is a deliverer but not believe that he is a healer. So your faith might be strong in that area, but not be strong in a way that you believe God can heal your mind or heal your body or heal some loved one. It's possible. So we have to start with believing that he is. Now, that's important because we also have to believe that he is in charge. I've heard Christians recently say that God is, what is it, what is the saying? They don't like to say that God is in charge. They say God is, no, they say God is in control, God is not in control, he's in charge. I think it's a foolish statement because you ever met anybody that was in charge, in control, but not in charge? So it, it's a foolish statement that I, I even did a teaching on that to refute that because it's just a fool. It's just foolishness. In order for you to be able to see that God is, you have to understand that God is in charge. His position is absolutely critical to your deliverance in anything that you do. If you don't first see him as the one in charge, as the one in control, you're going to struggle to break free in various areas. So I want to look at what the Bible says about him 
being in charge. Look at James 2.19. Let me say that there's, some, there, there's God, there's angels, there's demons, there's humans, and they're animals. And there are levels of authority and structure to each one of them. And you have to understand that God is in charge. Oftentimes, I think one of the most devastating things I see often, especially when people who come out of witchcraft, people who come out of witchcraft sometimes frustrate me because they've been in a, uh, uh, in a position of seeing um, a lot of power operating. And witchcraft is real. It's very real. So they've seen a lot of power. They've done astral projection. They've been outside their bodies and floated around and did all kinds of things, put curses on people and see things, terrible things happen to people. And, and, and then when they get saved, one of the things I've noticed that they do is they talk about how many, they almost brag about it, how many Christians they destroyed or how, many, how weak Christians were and how easy they were to deceive or how easy they were to harass. And, and it's very disturbing to me that they come with that point of view. And so when they come with that point of view, it, it, they always have this, this, it just had this way of somehow trying to make it seem as if God and Satan are equals in the battle. You know, and we, a lot of times we think of him that way. We, we talk about him like he is the great Satan and then there's the great God and these two great powerful beings, equal in power are fighting that's not the case. They're not equal in power. And we don't even see God fighting him. The Bible says in Revelation, the ain Michael and his angels fought, and the dragon and his angels fought. We don't see God wasting his time fighting. He doesn't step beneath the throne. It's beneath him to fight with that little, that little created being that he created. He leaves that work to the angels. So a lot of times we have this worldview or this idea that he is here and we are terrified of him. And I would dare say, I would dare say more Christians are more afraid of Satan than they are of God. And just, just by watching their reactions a lot of the time, just things they do. If a person coming to church and saw all of a sudden person is demon possessed, Christians are scattered like roaches. But yet God will come into church and I'll see Christians do all kinds of things that one should not do in the presence of God. So we have to come to that place of understanding who he is. So let's look at James. James 2. What does James 2 say? And I'm going to get to authority tonight. You still with me, little poopy? Let's look at James 2.19. He says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Look at that. So what we're seeing is that God and Satan and demons, they ain't equals. It's important for you to understand that God is in charge. Hands down in charge. Um, look at Mark 8, 29. Come on, 829. Hey, come on, buddy. Come on. Uh -huh. Make sure I got my scriptures right. Mm -hmm. I messed that one up, y'all. I can go. I got plenty of more, though. Plenty of them. Mark 1, 23 and 24. Talks about Jesus casting out spirits. It says in now 23. Now there was a man with an unclean spirit in the synagogue, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What now this is a spirit crying out. What have we to do with you, Jesus? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This is important. This is authority. This is God demonstrating that He's in charge. He's showing us He's in charge. And he does it over and over and over again. I mean, I'm trying to look at, not trying to look up all the scriptures, but if we go through Mark 1, 21, well, that's that one. Mark 1, 
29. Um, it says, Now as soon as they come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. Now, in Luke 4.39, it says Jesus rebuked the fever. So I want you to understand what's happening. God is demonstrating in the scriptures that he is definitely in charge. He's in charge of sickness. He's in charge of disease. He's in charge of demons. He is, in fact, in charge. There is nothing on earth that does not come under his power. If we went to Job, we would see that Satan uh, it, it wants, to, wants to attack Job, right? And it's clear that he's already looked at Job because he says, well, look at all the stuff you put in his life. So he didn't, he, Satan didn't have to go, well, who is Job? He knew who Job was because he had been there, but he couldn't touch him. Because God had established some limits, places where he could not go. So God demonstrates all throughout the scriptures that he is in charge. Every single place. Then look at Mark 134. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out demons and did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Are y'all seeing that? He did not allow them to speak. He demonstrates that he is God. Emphatically. There's no question about who he is. It's important. If you're going to conquer anything, mental illness, or anything, it's important. This is going to be very important that you understand. One of the things that helped me when I had to deal with this issue is I, I got to see, when they would choke me on the bed, I, would, I told you I would have experiences. Sleep paralysis is what the medical world calls it. But when you can see it, it doesn't seem so much like sleep paralysis anymore. Being choked night after night, multiple times, just harassed. And I told you I had a visionary experience where I was in the house and I saw these hideous beings and realized that they were afraid of me. It was, it was a shocker. I was terrified. They was terrified. They were scared. I realized during the experiences also that every time I said the name of Jesus, in fact, you couldn't talk. If you've ever suffered with sleep paralysis, you know you can't talk. Now, I do know how to do all that stuff now, but you can't talk. You can only think, and at the thought of Jesus, the experience stops. Everything stops. That was a grand moment in my life, because I'm telling you these experiences were torturous, tormenting. But when I got to the place of understanding that they were afraid of him, the tables turn. That's why it's so important for you to understand who he is. Because if you don't understand who he is, then watch this. We go to the next step. You won't understand who you are. It's very important. Very important. Now, as I go through this part, I want y'all to listen to what I have to say. And I'm going to challenge you, but and I'm going to use some illustrations that I'm going to try to get across without them sounding off. I'm going to try my best. Just stay with me. Let's look at Luke 10, 17. Luke 10, 17. Listen to what this, this is when Jesus sends out the 70. We like to talk about the fact that Jesus sent out the 12 and gave power to the 12. Somehow we forget that Jesus also gave power to 70. 
Then the 70 returned. This is, he had given them power to heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, all of that. Now, of all the things that they were allowed to do, they came back excited about one thing. You don't know if they raised any dead, but you know that something happened. What they did the most of, they seem very excited by. And it says this. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. So get this. We talked about the fact that when you talk about spiritual identity, you have to first start with the identity of God. You got to know who he is. He's got to be a healer. He's got to be a deliverer. You've got to see him as the one that's in charge and in control. Because when he gives you power as he gave them, then they were able to exercise that power in direct relationship to their understanding of who he was. So the demons weren't subject to them. They were subject to them in his name. Are you with me? It's important. Because God gives them power. And that power is only operational when they understand its connection to who he is. If they don't think that he can cast out a demon, if they don't think he can heal, then no matter how much power they have, they're not going to use it. Same is true with you. If you don't understand who he is, then cancer will intimidate you when you have to pray for people. Uh, multiple sclerosis will intimidate you when you stand before people. Mental illness will intimidate you when you stand before people. Demon possession will intimidate you when you stand before it because you don't understand who he is. Are y'all with me? Look at Acts 19 and 11. Acts 19 and 11. The Bible says God does stop. Pop. It says now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Whose hands did he use? Paul's. He used Paul's hands, right? So that the handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the disease left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Look at what's happening. Look at what's happening. I'm not going to make this argument here right now. I could show you the relationship between demons and sickness. I won't do it here because that's not what this one is about. But, because I've done that in plenty of videos. But I want you to see that the cloths from Paul's body. So, so get it. The demons were afraid of Jesus. The demons were afraid of the 70. And the demons are afraid of Paul. But none of it is possible outside of that understanding of who he is. That is important. So your understanding who he is helps you understand who you are. It's important. It's important. It's important. Now, it's important because of this. John 1 and John uh, 1 John 1 tells us, greater is he that is what? In you. So if you don't understand him that is in you, if you don't see him as in charge, you're not going to understand how to move in any kind of power. It's just not going to happen. Because you don't understand who he is, it leaves you in a lacking of understanding who you are. Watch this. It gets better. Colossians 1.27 says Christ in you, the hope of glory. What Christ? The same Christ that the demons were afraid of when we read through the book of Mark. The same demons were afraid of that Christ. 
that Christ now lives in you. So when you talk about doing any type of deliverance or ministering to people with any type of issue, you have to start there. Now, when God taught me this years ago, years ago, this is one reason why I don't let people make excuses for sin in their life. Because, go tell all of Aaron, I said, be quiet. This is why I don't let people make excuses. Because the creator lives on the inside of you. And because he lives on the inside of you, you have all the power you need to be able to resist. And the Bible says, if you walk in the spirit, it's a matter of choice. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, the last video, last time we were, were together, I showed you something that happened in Saul's life. I showed you that King Saul got in trouble with God and God sent an evil spirit. Stop. They can see you. Stop. I sent an evil spirit in his life. And I told you, excuse me, I told you that we see the spirit, the Bible says, and the spirit came upon Saul, and then, excuse me, and then he hired David to play music for him. Spirit leaves. The spirit came upon Saul a second time. Of course, playing with David, spirit leaves. The spirit comes upon Saul the third time. By this time, he has en engrafted an idea about, he's engrafted an idea, and now, when you look at the rest of Saul's life, you will never again see that the evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. Well, why not? Why do you see it in the beginning and not in the end? Because see, in the beginning, Paul was, uh, King Saul was fighting it. That's what the point of hiring David was, to fight it. He was fighting off what was trying to take over his mind. He was get, he did music. He, he was fighting it. At some point, though, he gave in to the idea, and once he gave in, he no longer fought back. He just allowed the spirit to, and see, God taught me this is how people get demons. He said, Kevin, this is how they get them. They stop fighting back. They cease resisting, and they give in, and then they just, then from that point, we don't see Saul and the evil spirit. We see Saul with the evil spirit, and the manic behavior that he demonstrated early on that he was once trying to resist is now part of his entire life and he spends the rest of his life just chasing David down until he dies. Y'all seeing that? <clears throat> so that's why it's so important that you understand who you are because you have the choice of yielding to these spiritual beings that are present. So I don't let people make excuses when they say Satan is dominating me. Why is Satan dominating you? The Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. How so is it possible that the same God that the demons fell on the floor to in terror of, the same God that, that, that lived in Paul, that caused them to flee from his clothing, how is it that that same God lives in you and they're not afraid of you? That's not the problem. The problem is you don't know who he is and you don't know who he is in you and through you. And so you're not fighting. And you're giving in. And they're dominating you. And I'm telling you, they will dominate your mind. They will dominate your health. They will dominate your finances. They will dominate anything that you're willing to yield to. Because I tell people, it's never about them taking over you. Or even God taking over you. It's about who you choose to yield to. It says, if you Walk in the spirit. If you means you have to make the choice. Walk in the spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So it's a matter of who's in you. Now, this is important. And this is where I get into my illustrations where I want to be careful with what I say. This is what allows me to be able to operate in a level of authority. Because God taught me about this. And I was like, Lord, you got to give me a way to explain this. And, and But the way he gave me to explain it, I wasn't comfortable with. That's just, I mean, I'm just being honest. But I'm going to explain it to you the way he explained it to me. And I want you to pay attention closely to what I say. Because if not, you're going to misconstrue what I say. I want you to see this. We are new creations. God, I told you how God spoke to me in the mall um, 1996 and said, I deputize thee in my name. I deputize thee in my name. 
And when he did so, he began to explain for me for three, I had to take off from work for three days while he talked to me straight for three days and explained to me over and over, explained to me who we are, what he had done and what it meant. And when he got finished talking, I experienced what I thought was power at the time because I felt like I was in charge of the world. And what it was, it wasn't power, it was authority. It was authority. Some of you never experienced what authority feels like. Oh no. When you understand who God is on the inside, you will experience a level of authority that will be unexplainable. You're going to feel like you're in charge of the world. I'm going to tell you why you're going to feel like that. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go longer than I want to go tonight. If you're a government worker, you ain't going to work anyway. <clears throat> but the Bible tells us we are new creations in Christ. Some of us just don't take things literal when we read through the scriptures. We don't take things literal. So I'll give you an example of, of, of one of the things that happened when God was talking to me for those three days. I had, prior to that, I had started to have a desire to, to play music and write songs and do things. And, you know, I was a rapper, so I could do some, I was a bit of a wordsmith, but never a songwriter, just a rap rapper. Um, and I couldn't play, my, I could only play piano with one hand. I couldn't do two. I, I, you know, I just couldn't. And so I left it alone. During that time period of God talking to me, he started talking to me about grace and faith and how to access the grace of God that he had put in us and, and being a new creation and all of this stuff and how we were new. And so I said to him in the midst of the conversation, I said, so are you telling me that you've done something so new in me that I can play this piano? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I'm going to do it. And then I sat down and I played a song I had never heard before. It like came out of heaven. And I began to play the piano perfectly with two hands, making songs. Never changed my life. Not only did I get that, but I got a writing gift. I hate writing. I hated writing. I still hate reading. But yet God has made me a writer. It's like something new in me that he's done on the inside of me. But in the midst of that, he also explained to me that there is a new creation. This is where you got, you're going to have to pay attention to what I say. I'm going to walk you through the scriptures on it because it's, it's the best way to do it. You are something different. Now, let's look at what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. We're going to go there first. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. And just so y'all know, my kids are trained in this. I taught my kids all of this stuff. Because one thing about my ministry is I have to fight with the invisibles. And sometimes, since they realize they're not going to have any success with me, they make my children their targets. That's why I said you should be careful about asking for people's anointings. You don't know what they have to deal with to walk in the anointing they have. Look at what it says. It says that he's talking to them about being godly and, and sexuality. And he says this in 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. One spirit. That there is a commingling. That even though we see the Spirit of God speaking to Peter and the Spirit of God speaking to Philip, and the Spirit of, even though we see it, it says there is one Spirit. It says that it says other things. It says like we have the mind of Christ, huh? We have the mind of Christ. That's why I don't let I don't like when people say, "I has not seen, ears has not heard." Because the next verse says, but he has revealed, revealed, past tense, these things to us. There's nothing that you can't know that you need to know. That's why I teach on the voice of God and preach on the voice of God. Because you need to know so you're not walking in darkness. But we are one spirit. It is something new. Now he tried to give us, what is the something new? And this is where I got to be careful. Because there are people who teach 
that Christians are little gods. It's a teaching that I, boy, I just got finished arguing with somebody online about it a few weeks ago. Christians are little gods. Christians are not little gods. They're not little gods. They're not little versions of God. And the reason that is a dangerous doctrine is because it leads us into a place of independent thought so that we no longer seek God or depend on God to do things because we believe that the power in us is self-generated. But we are not gods. What we are is people indwelled with God, whose spirits are commingled with God. They're clearly two distinct persons, but somehow God has merged with us and we follow his lead. That's why I tell people, you can trust your inner man. When he wants to go left, go left. If he wants to get up on the plane and get off the plane, you better get up and get off the plane because he knows where he's going and what's right. Might not make sense here, but you might have that urging, that nudging to do a certain thing, you better do it. That's him trying to help you out, trying to lead you. That's because he's one with you and he's come inside. Now that's important. Because he tries to show us what it looks like. He was forecasting the new creation for a long time. A long time he forecasted it. Right? It's people. What people look like when they work with God. Moses was an example of what people look like when they work with God. Elijah was an example of what people look like when they work with God. Uh, Eli I mean, Elisha. Uh, Josiah, uh, all of those people, they are examples or forecastings of what it is when people of the new creation that God was, was working on is when people are working with God. Y'all get it? Stay with me. It's when people are working with God. See that? When you get to the New Testament, God does not have hand-picked selected people. He then has a people that he indwells. And now there's not Moses, but there's a whole church full of people. And so Corinthians 12 lays out the gifts and talks about the gifts and the supernatural abilities that God has placed in us. And how that it's a whole church full of people. Whole church full of people. Like Moses. A whole church full of whole community of people. Like Elisha, a whole community of people like Elisha, a whole community of people like Ezekiel, a whole community of people operating with the capacity to operate in the supernatural authority, supernatural power of God. Now, this is their illustration. I want you to hear what I'm about to say clearly because this is the best way I can help you see what it is. Uh, what the new creation is. It's the best way I can explain it to you. It's the only natural thing that I can relate it to to help you see what God has done that makes you a new creation. If you've ever been a follower of Greek mythology, Greek mythology would have these certain characters in their midst who were what they call demigods. And what the demigods were or they were a product of the gods having intercourse with the women, with the humans, and causing a child then to come forth. So that the child was not really human, but the child was not really a god. It was a mixture. Now hear me. I'm not saying that we are demigods. Let me say that again, because, you know, I've learned over the years, people are good at putting words in your mouth. I'm not saying that we are demigods. I'm saying that that is a depiction of the how God has recreated us. We are people indwelled with the spirit of God. Are y'all with me? Now, lest you think I'm the only person Unless you think that sounds a bit weird, and I know it does, I'm going to show you something. 
Go to 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. It says, let's start with one. And brethren could, brethren could not speak to you as, I could not, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people. Remember, we talked about spiritual. But as to carnal, as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal? Watch what he says. And behaving like mere men. That is the most. I thought that was the What do you mean? Behaving like mere men. Well, what are they if they're not mere men? See, there was an expectation that Paul had of them to understand identity. To understand who they were in Christ. Because when they understood who they were in Christ, then they would understand that all of those people who were not in Christ, they are empty vessels. It makes sense that they struggle in their sin. It makes sense that they can't get anybody healed. It makes the sense that they can't get anybody delivered. They're just people. But we're not. We are people who are indwelled with the Spirit of God. And so the ant, it ups the ante on how we are expected to live and how we are expected to behave and what we are even able to do. Because we are people whom God has formed an intimate merger and partnership with. Are y'all with me on that? See, one of the things, when God taught me this, I see struggling with all kinds of sins. Now, does that mean I don't mess up? No, it does not mean that. I mess up. From time to every day, I mess up. But know what I don't do? I don't have any one area of my life that's dominated by anything. Nothing. I don't have any one area that's dominated by a sin. When God taught me that, that was the first thing that I began to gain control over was my life and my sex drive and my abilities. I gained control of my life because I realized he was with me. And because I realized he was with me, what demon was there that was going to resist me? Now, they resist, but what demon could overcome me or overpower me? None. Because I came to the place of understanding what it was to have God on the inside. He is my roommate. Me and him get along. That's why I told you I don't fall for the other lies that we are gods. We are not gods. But we are people with whom God lives. And he said he's going to live with us to the end of the age. He's with you. Once you get that in your mind, it's going to cause there to be a sense of freedom in you and what you can accomplish. Who's going to tell you you can't accomplish your dream? Who's going to say you can't get rid of mental illness or control the demons that are causing this pain in your life? Who? Nothing. Who can stand against us? Ain't that what the Bible says? See, you have to understand God is there in you. I don't know how else to say this. And this is one of those teachings I've never talked about that part that God revealed. Because I know it's so hard to explain. It's so hard for people to get. It was hard for me to get. In fact, it was one of the times I started going, well, maybe I hear it from the right, right spirit. Because it was so much to absorb that we're new. So when I say, hey, let's move in healing, I, that's all I have to say in the spirit of God. Go, Phew. It happens because I understand he's there. So I'm not intimidated by things because I know that he's there. All right. So Paul challenges us in this passage. To realize we're not mere men. Mere men can't heal the sick. Mere men won't raise the dead. Mere men are not in communication with God. He tells us that there's something about us different. Something about us unique. And it is the fact that the creator dwells on the inside of us. We're all God's creation. We are not all God's children. Be clear. We are all God's creation. 
but we are not all God's children. The Bible is very clear. Jesus said, you are the son of your father, the devil. There's some people who are sons of that's their daddy. We do not all have the same father. And if you have the spirit of God, then you know, you know that you have the spirit of God. There's power there. Now, that leads to what I'm going to get to next. And that is spiritual authority. Because if you're going to tackle mental illness or any other illness for that fact, or anything that you're trying to accomplish in your life, sin, habits, anything, you have to understand who you he is so you can understand what it means to have him live in you and understand who you are. Because understanding that then it's going to give you a sense of the next thing. You have to understand spiritual authority. Spiritual authority, I cannot say enough. You know, I started by telling you the first thing is understanding spiritual realities. If you do not accept spiritual realities, that they are demons and angels, if you don't accept the fact that they interact with people constantly over and over again, and I have seen it, God opened my eyes so I could see it. And they were everywhere. Demons and angels. Everywhere. They are everywhere. Wherever you go, I promise you they're there. Either in somebody, on somebody, around somebody, there's always something spiritual going on. I showed y'all in Revelations. The first, one of the things God does to bring peace on earth, we're going to have like a thousand years where Jesus reigns. And he does, all, and he, he he uh, locks up the devil for a thousand years and says, he who deceived the nations. So it implies that without him, there's no deception. So he's very involved. And that's why he keeps stressing, stressing spiritual realities. I watch people, marriages fall apart. Falling apart because they're just giving in, because they they're carnal minded in their point of view. And they're not looking at the spiritual sources and able to deal with those spiritual sources. And... <laughs> And then their families get ravaged. So the spiritual reality is important because next, you once you understand who you are and understand who he is, then you will understand what it is to walk in spiritual authority. What is authority? Authority is the right to use power. Delegated right to use power. It's not power. It is the delegated right to use power. In other words, you only have authority if someone greater than you has given it to you. So the Bible says all authority is from God. And so the only way a man becomes powerful in the earth is that God appoints him or puts him in that spot. And then God tells us to pray for him no matter how wicked or evil he is. And he saw that Nebuchadnezzar as wicked as he was. God punished him. One of the reasons he ended up suffering from insanity was because... God, because uh, of his pride, and God said, you're going to know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, right? So you're going to have to understand spiritual authority. Stop, Noel. Go on sleep. You're going to have to understand spiritual authority. So if we're going to conquer these different things in our life. I know this is about mental illness, but I, I, I need this to be about a broad. I'm going to make this sort of broad because... There are so many areas in Christians' lives where they need to understand just these basic principles apply to everything. Now, when you understand it in mental illness, then you will really be able to crack this nut open. But watch. <clears throat> Authority is the right to use power, and it is delegated by somebody with the power. That's why we had to talk about the fact that God is in control and in charge. He is both. He's in control, and he's in charge. And nothing happens on his watch outside of his knowledge. It just doesn't happen. It's important for you to understand that because he gives authority. We watched him give a power and authority to the disciples. Now, he talks about authority so much. When I read through Mark, it was just so interesting because Mark 1, 21 and 28 talks about Jesus' um, first teaching. And it says, and he taught with one that had authority. And then he cast out a demon during that same time. And they said, what doctrine is this? 
that he cast out demons, that even the demons are so. So they talked about even the demons being subject to his authority. Then we looked at it in Luke where he rebuked the fever. So we just see God operating in authority. He didn't heal people by power. He healed people by authority. He had been given power from God and he had the right to use it. Then he gave that power to the disciples. And we looked at it in Luke 10, the 70. And he gave them authority. And they said, oh, the demons are subject to us. Now we see that God gave them power. But they come back talking about their authority because authority comes with power. But authority is the right to use power. Are y'all with me? It is the right to use power. So when we talk about the adversary, and I'm going to get into this a little deeper. I got so much I want to say. Now my mind is just spinning with thoughts. When you're going to conquer things in your life, you have to understand authority. It's important. It's at the, it was at the root heart of Jesus' ministry. He understood it wasn't just power. The devil has power. So it's not power. You know what power does? Power refers to power has no hierarchy. Power only has strength levels. So you can be stronger than somebody, right? So you, power comes against, it's, it's, it comes against, and it might, somebody's stronger. So this is about power. So we've established that God has the bigger fist and he's the greater power. But that's, that's really not just the only key to, what, to, to understanding him. The other key is understanding that he has authority, which means he has the right to use power. So Satan has power. The question is, where does he have the right to use his power? That's what we're going to get, get into. <clears throat> now, I want you to understand this. There are three kingdoms that the Bible talks about. It says the kingdom of God. In Luke 17, 21, it says the kingdom of God is in you. So it talks about the kingdom of God in several places, actually. <clears throat> Then there is Luke eleven eighteen, talks about the kingdom of Satan. It says, when he, Jesus cast a demon out of a boy, and they call him Beelzebub, and he decides, I need to explain to y'all how this thing works. And he says, if Satan's kingdom is divided against itself, so he attributes that there is a kingdom that Satan has. So there's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan, then there is the kingdom of men. And so in Daniel 4, uh, Nebuchadnezzar gets himself into trouble with God. And they say this, that seven uh, years is going to pass over him. He's going to be crazy and, and, and suffer from insanity until he understands that the most high rules where? In the kingdom of men. So there's the kingdom of God. There's the kingdom of Satan. And there's the kingdom of men. Watch. Each kingdom has an authority, appointed authority, right? Each kingdom. So when you look, if you go to heaven, that is God's ultimate kingdom. That is the kingdom, right? Once you get there, you you safe, you good. That's why, I, you know, my mother died. I, I, I miss her, but I don't feel but so bad because I know she good. She's in that kingdom, the kingdom of God, where he rules and reigns and dominates. Then there's the kingdom of hell, kingdom of darkness. And if you submit yourself unto him and you find yourself going into, the, into hell, you're going to discover that there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. That is his place. He's been given authority in that place. Now, a lot of people seem to think that he's been given authority over the earth. But the Bible never calls him the God of the earth. In fact, the Bible is really clear in saying that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. So he not, it calls him the God of this age. In other words, it says that he is a major influence during this 
time period, that God has given him a time period in which he can operate, but he has not given him the earth. So who does God give the earth to? God gives the earth to us. Genesis 3. <clears throat> Genesis 3. Now, right about now, I'm sensing that something is stirring up in, in, in the hearts of people. That feeling you experience in his authority, you becoming awakened to the reality of the presence of God on the inside of you. And you becoming awakened to the fact that you're in charge of some things. That's why we have to be responsible. Now, in Genesis 3, Satan gets Adam and Eve into trouble. But you, you really don't appreciate the trouble that he gets them into until you understand what God had said about them. And he said, uh, <clears throat> he gave them charge of everything. I'm just trying to find that. I thought I had put that in my notes, but I didn't. In other words, God gives them God gives them all kinds. Here it is. He creates them. He says in Genesis 1, 20, says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image, and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, then he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds, over the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Say every living thing that moves on the earth. God establishes is that this is your place, Adam and Eve. This earth, hell may belong to Satan. Heaven, I'm taking care of, but this place I've given you to have dominion and authority over it. I want you to have authority over anything in the air. I want you to have authority that anything over creeping on the earth, anything that's in the water, I want you to have authority over it. But there's a key word in here. Key word in here. Because sometimes people don't understand authority comes with a need to do some work. People don't like work. I'm discovering that. He says, look, he says, uh, he tells them to subdue the earth. Now, the sub subdue is interesting. Because we've always assumed that God gave them a world that's under their control. But he didn't. He gave them a world that was under their charge, under their authority. The word subdue means to bring under control, to exercise control over. Now you say, wait a minute. Where's the example? Well, we know where the example is. We see it in Genesis type chapter 3. When the serpent clearly among the kingdom of the creeping things that Adam was told to rule is not under Adam's rule. And so he then begins to talk to Adam and Eve against the thing that God has told Adam and Eve not to do. And so they listened to the thing they were supposed to have authority over. Are y'all with me? They listened to the thing that they were supposed to have authority over. They did not subdue him. They were supposed to subdue him. That was what they were commanded to do. And they did not subdue him. And because they allowed him to rule and reign on the earth, sin entered into the world. And then all the rest of us got in trouble before we even had a chance to do anything to get in trouble. Because he did not understand. He did not walk in his authority. Now, at no point did God ever 
change authority. No point. At no point. But man lost his connection to the image of God and loses and gives over his authority. And so like Saul, when the first attack comes, we fought back. Second attack comes, we fight back. But then we just gave in. And before you knew it, there was no image of God. You know what I tell people? A lot of people like to say that. We were made in the image of God. You were made in the image. That's why you shouldn't do this. Shouldn't. Let me tell you, we were made in the image of God. But man fell from that image a long time ago. And so God now is trying to bring us into the recreate and bring us back into that image. And the word, the word image in the passage is a Greek word, a Hebrew word, tisalom. And it means shadow. It means that we are the shadow of a reality. We are a reflection of a reality. So that if God does like this, we should do like this. If God does like this, we should do like this. If God tells the truth, then we should tell the truth. If God lives holy, then we should live holy. If God loves people, then we should love people. If God gives the people, we should give the people. So when we're walking in that, uh, the characteristics of God, yeah, we're walking in God's image. But when you cease to walk in his image, then the Bible teaches us that, that it, when Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, it says that they walk in an entirely different image. He says, you do the will of your father, the devil. He was alive from the beginning and so are you, right? And so he shows us that even though we have, this is why I keep going back to this invisible reality, the invisible reality has a very real effect on us. Very real effect on our world. So at any given moment, people are manifesting an image of God or they're manifesting an image of Satan. At any given moment. And so that's why God encourages us to walk in the spirit. So Adam has the image of God. He loses everything. Listen, if you don't know, if you don't have the image of God correct, you won't have the image of yourself correct. So you won't understand how to walk in power because you won't see him as powerful. You won't walk, know how to minister to the sick because you won't see him as a healer. That's why I said, he who comes to God must first believe that he is. It pauses right there, puts a comma, and ends and starts. It's a weird statement. But it's the same as the I am statement. You're supposed to fill in the blank. Like I said, you can believe that God is a, dis a deliverer, but not believe that God is a healer. You can believe that God is in one thing and not believe that he is in another. All of us have areas where our faith is weaker in certain areas than in others. It's possible. So that's why it's important. So Adam does not have, they lose this, this authority. So then God shows up in the form of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that all of the characteristics, that he is the express image of God, which means he is showing us, the, he is revealing to us in what I call the shadow realm, God's reality. He's showing us what, how God loves people, how God treats people, how God cares for people, how God deals with an adulterous person caught in sin. Should we stone him? See, they thought they should stone him. He said, no, we shouldn't. So look at all of these different things, right? So there's this, this, they don't have that. So God, again, then he begins to show us something else. He shows us the authority of God. He shows us the authority of God. And he shows us that they are intruders called demons operating in a realm that is not where their authority lies. They don't have authority over the earth. Their authority is in hell. So when Jesus comes, he exercises authority over them and tells them to get out. Get out of that person. Now, I wasn't going to do it, but I might as well bring it. Let's go back. Let's go back to Acts 19. I've done it several times, but it's important. Because we are talking about mental illness, which is a type of illness. Number 
1911. It says, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchief or even or aprons brought from his body to the sick. And watch what leaves the sick. Now the sick in the passage is the subject of the sentence. The sentence is about the sick. Y'all with me? And look what leaves the sick. And diseases left them, them referring to the sick. And evil spirits, spirits went out of them referring to the sick. Y'all see that? Evil spirits left the sick people. I've been trying to tell people for the longest time. When you want to, the reason you're not successful in ministering healing to people is because you won't go after the evil spirits that are here illegally, here illegally, doing things in a place that you've been given authority over. Now, this is the point of having Christ in your life because without Christ, there's no way these renegade things, beings, and they are criminals. Now, if you want to understand what they're like, look at the gangs and gangs, the structure of gangs and the behavior of gangs. They are like the most uh, closest I think you can get to demonic. You see that? I think they're the closest you can get to demonic because of their behavior and their structure. Because demons are organized. I hate to tell you, they are not random or dumb or idiots. They are very structured and organized. And so when you're looking at this, when you're looking at this passage, you cannot ignore what you see in the sense that demons cause a lot of things in a place that they don't have authority to be. So God gives power to the disciples and power to the church because he said to the church, power would come upon them so that they could bring the things under control. We are still trying to subdue. Now, let me say this. It does not say that demons are diseases. It says that it clearly indicates that there is a connection between the two and they cause or can be a part of the situation causing the illness in the body. But remember when God said, God said in Genesis, we read, he said, I want you to subdue the earth. He said, I want you to have dominion over everything on the earth, everything alive, everything that creeps. So a lot of us, when we read the passage, we like to think of the things that we can see, lions, and bears, and at the time probably with dinosaurs and all kinds of different things, right? We forget that they are living things that are one cell. We forget that they are living things that are microscopic. But if they're on the earth, God tells us to have power over it. Right? I didn't make it up. It was there. He said over every living thing on the earth. An amoeba is a living thing. A bacteria is a living thing. A virus is a living thing. So I, they were always around. They didn't come because of sin. We just allow things to get out of, out of our control. And so Jesus comes and demonstrates that man can operate in control. He can subdue the earth. He can subdue sickness and disease. He can subdue demons who don't even belong here. Don't have any authority here. See, I'm trying to get y'all to embrace this because you're going to feel, you're going to feel the authority stirring up on the inside of you. They don't have any authority here. They don't have no right here. And that's why we are told to what? Cast them out. Well, why would you tell somebody to cast something out from a place where they belong? They don't belong here. These bodies don't belong to them. Our lives don't belong to them. The non-believers lives don't belong to them. They don't belong here. And for sure, since I'm teaching on mental illness, our minds don't belong to them. So when I started dealing with these issues, and being tormented in my mind, I got the revelation, number one, that there is a spiritual reality. <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't excuse it as my overactive imagination or a brokenness of my mind or a chemical imbalance. I accept what I saw as spiritual realities. Once I accepted what I saw as spiritual realities, God taught me 
about who he was. When I said Jesus, they would run, they would flee, the experience would stop. So he taught me who he was. Then he taught me where he was, and that was in me, and how to live with him and cooperate with him and hide in him. The, you know, don't ever be afraid of weakness. The Bible says his strength is made perfect there. So whatever you can't do, embrace it. It's all right. He'll fill a gap. He'll fill that gap. I am not a writer. I was a slow learning and reading development student. I was afraid to go to college because I wasn't sure I would be able to keep up because I had some type of, they would have said, a learning disability. Now I'm a writer. Now I'm a speaker. He will fill in the gaps. So, <clears throat> so I, I began to understand who he was in me. And then, they, then the last thing I did was I began to exercise my authority. I understood that they did not have authority to do to me what they were doing. They didn't have authority to even be here. And I ceased giving them permission to afflict me. And then I stood up to them and told them to stop. And guess what happened? Just like it started, it stopped. And I'm telling you. Now again, I told you there are three sources of mental illness. Sometimes it's hereditary. Sometimes your mind is literally broken. Like I had that accident. I'll tell y'all how I dealt with that. Um, a little, actually, I will tell you now. There is a spirit called trauma. Now, if you've ever seen Deliverance or watched Deliverance or done Deliverance, you know that there's a spirit called trauma. There's an evil spirit called trauma who seems to come when people experience traumatic events. And he just reminds them and reminds them and replays it. And it's completely out of their control. So when I had the accident, right after it, I started having these continual flashbacks of the accident. Continual flashbacks. And I said, hmm, let me confront whatever this is. Because I know my mind is under my control. See, when my mind ain't under my control, I go after whatever is trying to influence or inflict my mind. So I said, um... Spirit of trauma, we will not be doing this today. And I bound and rebuke him. And then I asked God to heal the memories and the pains on the inside. And I'll get to that when we talk about counseling next. And it stopped again immediately. I, it's so much so, I have a hard time even thinking about what happened. I try to think back to what happened. I said, Let me think back to what happened. I can't even think back to what happened. My mind continues to go forward. It doesn't go back. And forward, like a like a somebody who don't know how to drive a stick and be jerking back and forth. That's how some of y'all minds are back and forth, jerking and stuff. There's a spirit called trauma, and you can take authority over him, and he will leave you be. Those those thoughts and memories that keep coming back. But now let me say what I was about to say. I told you there's <clears throat> there's mental illness through hereditary. There's mental illness. We looked at these in the scriptures. They're all through scriptures actually. By um, uh, uh, Brokenness, when something happens, traumatizing happens, and your mind gets broken in the area, and God has to fix and heal it, that requires a counseling. So the third one was the, uh, you can have mental illness because there's some gift operating in you that you're unaware of, and you just need to be educated about such gift like discerning of spirits. Or it can be that you're being tormented by an evil spirit. So we talked about those three. This is going to help you with the last, if you're being tormented by evil spirits, then you're going to need to understand authority. And then you can take authority over it. So no, I don't, I've don't. i never had been on medication and my mind is under, completely under my control. There's no thoughts that I have that I don't want to have. There's nothing that just sneaks up on me, creeps up on me that I'm not able to deal with and go and I have absolute control of my mind. Because I know that it is with the mind that we serve God according to Romans. And I want y'all to I want y'all to understand that. This is just, you know, this is important for you to understand your identity and understand authority. It is at the I would dare say it's at the heart of Christianity. Because so many people I've met have no, they're tormented. They have no ability to resist anything. Well, they don't think, they don't know that they have the ability, but they 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 are completely overwhelmed by somebody that 
number one, does not have authority to be here. This is not his place to rule. His place to rule is in hell, not here. This is our place to rule. And so we are the ruler. Then I'm going to give you a short, uh, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you, give me you two little testimonies, then I'm going to get out of here. Because I trained my kids in this. Y'all can't see my daughter now, but earlier in the video, she had on a badge. When God spoke to me about authority and taught me about it, he made me wear a badge. So I walked around with a badge on for about a year. I think it was about a year. Uh, at work, everywhere. They thought I was crazy. I said, I'm practicing. I'm, I thought, and God made me wear it so that I would get a feel for authority, so that it would get ingrained. So when I train my kids, I train my kids the same way to walk in authority. I put badges on them so they understand that there are some criminals here on the planet that don't belong here. And from time to time, they're going to try to break in to your house or break in to your life or break in to your finances or break in to your health and they don't have the right to be there and you're going to have to exercise authority. So I trained them by giving them badges. So during the accident, and I trained them in healing, during the accident, I had hurt my thumb. And it was in pain and it just couldn't move it. And when I grabbed it, it was weak. And so since I had been training my children, I said to my son, I said, look, grab my hand, pray for my hand. And I told him what to say. I said, look, um, I want you to speak to the thumb. It's one with authority. Remember the badge, one with authority. Authority, the right to operate in God's power. And I said, look, grab the thumb, hold the thumb, speak to the thumb. I said, ask God to heal it. Let's pray. Because the Bible says, pray, believe in you receive. What we never do is the third part, and that is speak. So we spend all our time praying for God to heal people instead of speaking the healing after we believe God heard us. So I trained him to do that. And he prayed for my thumb. Well, he, he spoke to my thumb, healed, joints, ligaments, tendons, started feeling better. I said, do it again. Prayed a little more, started feeling even much better. So I said, this is from on a scale of one to ten, this is mile down to a five. I said, do it again. Went down to a one. I said, well, we shooting for uh, lower. He did it again. It was like almost, almost there. It was like at a point five. Did it again. Done. 13. I walked him through that process. Then my thumb feel great and I can use it and it don't hurt for me to move it. Authority. When you understand what's in you, you'll understand what you can do and how you can be a blessing to other people's lives. You'll understand it. There's another man named John G. Lake. Now, I haven't read a lot about John G. Lake because I was always into Catherine Kuhlman and Benny Hinn and, and Moore Cirillo and those were the more modern people. And it's my favorite, Smith's Wigglesworth. But John G. Lake understood redemption and healing. And he trained many people in healing. He had healing clinics where people would come, like they go to a hospital to get uh, to see a doctor, they would come to a healing clinic that he had set up. And it'd be just different rooms all over the city, like a building, where people would come in and get healed as a service. Well, they, he was in Africa, and they put a... And they realized that he wasn't afraid of that there was a town where there, it was some kind of infectious disease was plaguing the town, was plaguing the town, killing the town. And he wanted to go there and they said, oh, but you can't. And he explained to them that it, it couldn't hurt him. It wasn't going to hurt him because he understood his authority. And they put the, he said, put it in my hands. They put the disease in his hand and under a microscope and under a microscope, the disease the bacteria, the bat, whatever it was, virus, died in his hand. It died in his hand. Authority over every living thing on the earth. Every living thing. I know it's hard to embrace. I know that's a hard concept to get into our minds. Only because we're still struggling with understanding who God is, and then struggling to understand where he is. He lives in you. He is your roommate. He is your roomie. In fact, he's not 
It's not two spirits in you. It's only one co-mingled spirit, though they're two personalities, it's one co-mingled spirit. Those who have, I believe in the Lord, a one spirit, one spirit with him. Are y'all with me? This is one of those things I've never taught on the authority on that revelation that God gave me. Never. Because I wasn't sure people would even be able to receive it. But it has been the biggest blessing in my life. The biggest blessing in my life. And because a ministry of revelation means you're going to have to be attacked. Because you were having spiritual attacks. And I do have. They used, Like I said, they used to try to do. They don't do much of anything. Now they might try uh, pain or some other kind of thing. And they've tried to kill me so many times. I'm just, the idea of them trying to kill me doesn't even bother me anymore. I mean, like accidents or, or strains. Like I had a pneumonia one time and they threw on me. Didn't work. Still got rid of it. But they threw on me one time. It was so serious that none of the medications would work against it. Nothing. The doctors were perfect. When I go to the doctors for stuff, they'd be so perplexed. They'd be scratching their head. They'd be trying to figure it out. And I, you know, I go because I believe in doctors in the medical community and working with them. And when they can't do it, I just have to just you know, I cooperate, I will take the medicine, and I'll pray. Bind, rebuke, and it goes away. It's important for you to understand authority. You are in charge here on the earth as a believer. Now, we looked at a little, a little, we read a little further into Acts 19. We see Paul operating in dominance over the earth, right? We see him operating in dominance over sickness, dominance over disease, dominance over demons. One time he got bit by a serpent. And even the venom of the serpent couldn't destroy him because he was operating in another level of dominance over them too, right? So he walked in this level of dominance that didn't allow him, that allowed him to be effective because he understood his authority. It is key. Took me a long time, a long time to be able to understand it. I understood what it was to have the Spirit of God live in me and to conquer any sin. There's nothing that I don't conquer. But it took me a long time when it came to dealing with healing and ministry because this took me a long time to accept that God is working with me in this. I don't have to work by myself. And so, look, there was, I'll end this right here. There's a guy whose wife had cancer, has cancer. And he'd been praying. For. And I wanted to encourage him. When it, in these situations, you try to be delicate because everybody's not accepted of healing and or the ministry of healing. So I said to him, I said, well, you're a minister in training. Can I, can I share something with you? And he said, sure. I said, when Jesus taught us, how many people did Jesus pray for? He said, no, I'm not going to think about it. I said, no, you've never seen Jesus put his hands on anybody and pray for anybody. Never prayed for not one single person. You never saw it. I said, how many people did the disciples pray for? He said, none. I said, we've been doing it wrong. That's why we've been so ineffective. And we're doing it wrong because we're putting all of the responsibility on God when God has transferred the responsibility for healing to us. Now, he does the work. But he does it through us. I said, so Jesus tells us. He says, when you pray, believe that you receive. And then he says, anything you say. I said, we're good at the praying. And we're good at the believing. We never do the last step. We never speak. So I told him, when you go home to your wife, you've already done the praying. God heard you. You know he heard you. Put your hands on your wife and start telling the numbers of her cancer, those, those numbers to go down. Tell the lump to go down. Now, they can get to telling them about the evil spirit because they might not be ready for that. I'm probably going to go over there and help them with that one. But he has to be willing to speak. That's the last phase. So we're famous for that. We're famous for getting people together. And we do it that way because we still have not come to the place of accepting the authority that God gives us. The disciples understood it because when they went out, the Bible says, and they healed. Now, we know that they didn't heal. 
but it was it was, it was a depiction of the fact that they embraced a responsibility and they ministered it and they said the demons are subject to us it's important so when we deal with mental illness and anything in that realm y'all anything you have to accept that there's a spiritual reality to it and you have to like, understand who you are in Christ but you first have to understand who he is and when you get all of that together then you'll understand your authority and then demons won't intimidate you and sickness standing before you won't intimidate you you'll be able to minister to it now one thing I told him your faith, the Bible says, goes from faith to faith. And glory to God. We go from faith to faith. Your faith may start out small and you might have faith for pains. And you might not have faith for cancer at the time. You might, like I told you, he who comes to God must first believe that he is. You might not be able to see that he is a healer of cancer, but you might be able to see that he's a healer of arthritis. So it goes into various levels. So as your faith, and you'll see that with the disciples. They gave, he gave them power. They had been healing all of these people, casting out demons. Then it came to a demon, and all of a sudden, the same power they had was not working anymore. So your faith goes through, your faith goes through different stages and to different levels. But at least we need to start with understanding, start where we are, and deal with the things that come before us and minister in faith and in our authority. You can be healed of mental illness. Again, when those demons were trying to torment my mind, I got the revelation of who I was, and that was it. Now, the hunters have become the hunted, and I fear none of them. And I'll be looking for confrontation with them. I'm not worried about them because I understand who the, who's in charge. They are not, they are intruders here. And so that's why God gives us that command. We like to talk about the Great Commission and preaching the gospel, but we don't like to talk about the other parts that refer to healing the sick, raising the dead, and casting out demons. You know, God said to me one day, and let me let this go, but I, he said to me one day about the, uh, somebody had died, and he said to me in the tone of his voice, I'll never forget the tone of his voice when he spoke to me. The person died, and he said, they don't even ask. That's what he said. He said, they don't even ask. They don't even give me a chance to say no. And what he's referring to was raising people from the dead. So I said, okay, Lord, I will ask to raise the people from the dead. And I asked. People look at me like I'm crazy. But I have asked. It's a hard thing to ask a person. But I did ask. So when we understand authority, if we understood our authority. The difference between this dispensation of the church and the last one is they understood that. And that's why they were the ones who the Bible describes as turning the world upside down. They didn't have a car, they didn't have a plane, didn't have any of these ways of travel that we have that allow us to get to any part of the world no matter how remote it is in the world, no matter how far it is, we can reach it but it won't matter if we get there and don't understand our authority. That's why I love Africans. I don't know why Africans' faith is the way it is, but people in Africa just are just phenomenal people. All my African listeners are phenomenal people. They just have faith. They just believe. And they see incredible things because they dare to believe that the God who lives in them is capable of challenging, of handling anything. So I'm going to let this go right here. I'm going to get YouTube. They done messed up my YouTube. Now I'm going to have to try to download this one. And that's a whole other thing. So when we get back the next time, I am going to deal more with spiritual, uh, with uh, mental tackling, mental illness. But this time, I'm going to deal with counseling. Because we have to talk about counseling. I believe in counseling. And, you know, whatever reason, black people just get offended at the word counseling. You need counseling. Counseling simply means you have gone as far as you can in your life for trying to make something work and you don't have the solution. So you go to somebody who can help you continue to go forward in your life and figure out what's hindering you. That's all counseling is.
you need counsel. And if you fall into the category of people who have seen things that are traumatic and have your mind broken, you're going to need counseling. You might need spiritual counseling with deliverance, but you also just going to, you're going to need counseling. There's no way you should be having secrets about things that happened to you. You need to lay on somebody's couch. And I'll deal with that when we come back because I want us to come to value. And I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show you in the cases where Jesus dealt with the, the places where there was mental illness, those are the only two places where we see Jesus talking to the people in the situation. It tells us that counseling is important when you're dealing with mental illness. You need to get counseling. It's okay. It's all right. So I'm going to leave this right here. Um, welcome to Doing Life on Fire. And I'll see y'all. I'm not going to say when because I said I would be on this yesterday and then that didn't work out. So I'm going to try to get back on here tomorrow because nobody going to work or school tomorrow. So I might do it tomorrow. So I'll see y'all tomorrow. Have a good night. Father, seal these words in their heart and make everything plain. May they know what authority is and what it is to walk in authority and what it is to conquer and dominate so that we can make the kingdoms of this world the kingdoms of our God so that we can conquer, so that we are not on the bottom of the wrestling match with Satan all the time, but that we may dominate his presence on the earth. May you be glorified in your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.